Okay, good morning everybody. Another Sunday has come around, right? The last day of June. Tomorrow starts July. My little great-grandson that we watch on weekends, he will be turning 18 months on the 4th, Independence Day, right? Little Schaefer is just so smart. My guy, he amazes me. Anyway, today, back in the book of Acts, and uh, we'll be talking about Peter and John being quote unquote arrested, drugged before the Sanhedrin, where Peter delivers one heck of a sermon to the leaders of Israel in Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me uh, take a sip and let's open with a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, thank you, as always, for your many, 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 many gifts. Thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for Jesus, who paid the price for all our sins. Thank you for your Holy Spirit being with us. And today, again, as we open your word, may your spirit speak to each and every one of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. But well, you remember we talked last week how Peter and John had gone to the temple and here's a guy that had been lame from birth, right? And we're gonna find out later, he's more than 40 years old. He's been sitting at the gate begging all this time. Everybody knew him because everybody passes by and probably sometimes gives him a little bit of this and that. Well, Peter and John approach him and say, I don't have the money to give you, but what I've got, <laughs> in the name of Jesus, walk. <laughs> Boom. The guy jumps up off the ground. He's now walking and jumping and praising God. For the first time, he gets to enter the temple, created quite a, a commotion because everybody knew this guy, right? And here he is healed all of a sudden. Like, what the heck? And, Peter and John are preaching to the people and uh, something like 5,000 men, right, were saved that day. Now, they're in the temple in Solomon's portico. They're not in the, I don't think they're in the court of the females you know, or the, in the Gentiles. And so uh, I think everybody there would have been a Hebrew male. But talks, we find out later, about 5,000 added to the number. Well, we read in chapter 4, as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, keep in mind, the Sanhedrin consisted of the leaders, mostly Sadducees, some Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee, okay? And the Pharisees believed in life after death, but the Sadducees didn't. And so they're talking, talking about Jesus rising from the dead and preaching how if you can be forgiven of your sins and after your death on earth, right, you'll now have life in heaven with Jesus forever. And they're like, we can't have them preaching this. This is not what we believe, right? You can't preach it in our temple. <laughs> they were very greatly disturbed by this. And, you know, the Romans had charged the Sanhedrin, you know, the Sadducees in keeping the peace. And of course, they're having a hard time keeping the peace when they themselves are the ones stirring up all the problems in mm -hmm. reality, right? But and they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day for it was already evening, okay? Now, do you remember what time they went to the uh, temple? the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. 
it's evening, so it's after five. So Peter had been preaching for two hours plus probably. So they take them, put them in their jail until the next day. Now keep in mind, Peter and John were put in jail. Okay? Because the former lame man will be with them the next day. Okay? Many of those who had heard the message believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. The men who believed, okay? <laughs> the Lord was adding to their number, wasn't he? And it came about on the next day that the rulers, the elders, the scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin had uh, 71 members, so if they were all there, Right, you'd have 71, but we also have other elders and scribes. Plus, we also have, get over this, and Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, the former high priest, and John and Alexander, we don't know much about them, but, and all who were of the high priestly descent. All right? So if you were somebody in the family of the high priest, they're all there, okay? So I don't know what the number is, but let's say it's 100, just for kicks. Not that it really matters, <laughs> but they're, they're all there. But then Peter, well, they said, let me read verse 7. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? They'd just been preaching it the day before for two hours, right? by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, right? The one that you guys voted to crucify, the one who God rose from the dead, right? We are witnesses to all of this. In his name, this man is healed. And now they're saying, in what name? Meaning the character of the person that you're talking about, right? They're talking about Jesus, right? Meaning the character of, of Jesus. Verse, they say, what name? Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. He gives them, you might say, whatever respect they would be due. And remember, these guys are very, very intelligent. Very intelligent. And they had basically memorized the whole Torah and a lot of the rest of the Old Testament, right? They could quote everything to you left and right. And you don't get to be a member of the Sanhedrin with average intelligence, okay? <laughs> Which makes it kind of funny that the teacher of the teachers, Nicodemus, comes to Jesus and Jesus says, you know, you, know, you must be born again. And he's like, how could a man enter his mother's womb again, you know? He's the teacher of the teachers, and these guys are all brilliant men, and they don't get it at all, do they? Right? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit, right? When you turn your heart over to Jesus, you're born again. As I am. Born again, baptized believer in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Doesn't mean I'm sinless, because boy, I sure am not, right? But I'm saved. Thank you, Jesus. The only thing you can say, thank you, Jesus. I didn't do it. I didn't have basically anything to do with it. None of us do. We can't. It's impossible for us to earn salvation. The only way is just turn your life, turn your heart over to Jesus, and he washes away your sins. All right? The song that um, the evangelist, oh my gosh, Billy Graham, can close out all his deals with, just as I am. All right? With all my flaws, all my sins, all right? just as I am, I come.
That's the way you come. You can't fix it. You can't make it better. You can't make yourself worthy. You just say, man, am I tired of all this crud? I come. Right? Filled with the Spirit. So he gives them the respect that their position would uh, expect, you know, deserve. Now, these guys obviously, as Jesus said, they're whitewashed tombs, followers of Satan themselves, unfortunately, right? And then that's Satan tricks lots of people throughout history. Lots of people we thought were good people turn out to be really bad people because Satan had tricked them. Anyway, he says, if we are on trial today <laughs> for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well or healed, if we're on trial because a sick man is healed, <laughs> think about that for a second. We'll find out here in a little bit. He's over 40 years old. And he's now healed. Everybody should just be saying, praise God, right? No, we're on trial because the sick man is now healed, right? <laughs> right? This good deed, the benefit done to the sick man. Now, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel Everybody listening, spread the word that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the name of Jesus, this man is healed, whom you crucified. Now, remember, they're in the middle, and there's a circle of them around them, so everybody could hear the testimony. Okay? That was normal, by the way. By the name of Jesus, this man is healed whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. Right? By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. What are you going to say? You don't believe in life after death? Well, God does. <laughs> right? You know, you don't believe Jesus is the Messiah? Well, God does as does now this man. And us, it says, he is the stone. Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders. You're supposed to be building up the country of Israel, right? Teaching them the word of God, which became the very cornerstone, right? This man became the very cornerstone. And there is salvation, right? Make it clear. There is salvation in no one else. No one, period. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. We must be saved. If you're not saved, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire, right? So you have a choice. And there's no other name. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not anybody else. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And this whole concept of the book, he's quoting Psalms 118, right? These guys have heard this from Jesus, we go back to Luke 20, right? Verses 17, Jesus looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone, right? Which the builders rejected. Quoting Psalms 118, verse 22, right? This became the chief cornerstone. This is what the whole church the whole concept of salvation is based on Jesus, the cornerstone. There's no other name under heaven, right? 
Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like the dust. Rejecting Jesus is extremely costly. Right? They had heard this from Jesus. Now they're hearing it from Peter. Maybe John. They're both there together. And guess who's with them? <laughs> the lame man. <laughs> Walking, jumping, praising God, right? There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Can't be done any other way. Not under my name. Larry can't be saved by Larry or anything Larry does. Only by Jesus. And by the way, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit of God, grabbing Larry by the scuff of the neck and said, will you pay attention? <laughs> right? But I finally surrendered, became a Christian. But my faith, right, my whole existence, my eternity in the hands of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, you know, they saw Jesus three and a half years to, and then he was crucified. And then the weekend, three days, three nights is in tomb. And then boom, now he's alive again. And they saw him many times alive again, doing miracles before and after, right? They were completely convinced, right? Completely convinced. And they, the confidence they had and understood that they were uneducated. These hadn't people haven't gone to the Hebrew school, our schools, you know, these, these are fishermen, right? You know, and marveling, educated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. I would have think they would have known about John all, all, all along. John had a, a reputation and was known in the temple, you know, and was known to be a follower of Jesus before. Uh, Peter had denied Jesus on the night of the crucifixion. Right? So they may not have had the same thing, but anyway, they realized that these guys had been with Jesus. These are followers, apostles of Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them. So they're on trial for healing, <laughs> right? And boom, this guy pops in. How do you get in there? I don't think he spent the night in the prison with him because he was healed. But God saw to it that he was standing there. So when they gathered him up and gathering everybody up for this confrontation with the Sanhedrin, this man, being healed, being grateful, said, I'm going to be there. He's standing with them. I think that's amazing. Seeing the man who had been healed, standing with them, they had nothing to say to reply. How do we, how do we argue? This guy's healed. <laughs> we know him. We all know him. Everybody knows him. Right? And he's now healed. You can't deny that. So what are we going to do? When they had ordered them to go out, the side of the council, they began to confer with one another. Right? So here's the Sanhedrin. Now trying to figure out what is it we're going to do. It's interesting that it doesn't occur to them that they might simply believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? And yes, it doesn't coincide with what they were expecting, the Messiah to take the throne of David and cast out the Romans and all of that stuff. And of course, that's what the apostles initially thought too until after the resurrection. They're like, okay, it's a different game, right? Did they take the time to investigate and say, what is this deal? 
Look at these miracles that this guy did before we had him crucified. We took him to the Romans and make sure they killed him, right? The Romans were very good at killing people, right? They knew what they were doing. They crucified him. They killed him. And then he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Three days later, the tomb's empty. They knew that. They know the whole story. They didn't have an answer. They're hearing about Jesus, popping in and out, showing up here and there, people seeing him, over 500 people at one time, right? The, the news is all over Jerusalem, right? They knew, but they didn't want to believe in Jesus. They stick to their guns. What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. We cannot deny the miracle. So how are we going to punish them for preaching in the name of Jesus, for preaching the resurrection of the dead? We don't believe that. <laughs> well, the Pharisees did. They didn't necessarily believe in Jesus, but they believed in, the, in life after death, right? But in order that it may not spread any further among the people, what are they thinking? Jesus has risen from the dead, right? And has appeared to many, many people. And the rumors of the miracles are spreading like wildfire, right? And this lame man, <laughs> yeah, as all Jerusalem are going to know within a few days that, that this lame man that's been at the temple for approaching 40 years, right, has been healed by the name of Jesus, right? In order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. <laughs> the gall. Right? And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak nor teach at all in the name of Jesus. So here is some fallen human beings telling them, you cannot preach the name of Jesus. You cannot preach the resurrection. You cannot preach being saved by Jesus. We command you. <laughs> Humans. They already had their marching orders from Jesus, who they knew to be God. I and the Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Right? They knew Jesus. He came in human form, right? But they knew he was God. Peter and John had seen the transfiguration on top of that. Now they've seen him raised from the dead. They knew he was God. And so these human beings are saying, you cannot teach in his name. <laughs> when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to preach or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter, <laughs> you know, Peter, he's got to get his word in there, right? <laughs> Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God, to give heed to you rather than to God, now you be the judge. Should we listen to you or should we listen to the Lord God Almighty? For we cannot stop preaching, speaking what we have seen and heard. Right? We cannot. You may not like it. So what? You're a frail human being. And you want to give me orders that already you try to contradict the orders that the Lord God has given to me? So they run into this, shall we call it a roadblock? They've been given orders by Jesus. Preach. 
preach in the name of Jesus. Tell people they can be saved. Just trust in Jesus. And the Sanhedrin saying, oh, don't do that. Or we'll punch you. What stops us from telling people about Jesus? You know, when was the last time that you told somebody about Jesus? I've told some people in chat rooms and telegram rooms and whatnot, WhatsApp. I'm trying to remember the last time in person that I told somebody about Jesus. And I bet it's been a couple of months that in person I've said something to somebody about Jesus. Well, not something, I mean, I've talked about, you know, Jesus, but to actually ask somebody, do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Because there's no other name under heaven mm -hmm. whereby we must be saved. You can't do it. Nobody else can do it for us. Nobody else can even help us. The Holy Spirit of God is here to witness to us and lead us to Jesus. It's kind of convicting. You'd think I would think of somebody in the last week at least, right? That I've had the opportunity to talk to about Jesus. I haven't met a lot of new people. The places I go to eat or whatever, or places I go to eat, they all know me. And I bet I've missed some opportunities. And I got a feeling you missed some too. We need to do better. We need to be more like Peter and John and let the Spirit lead us in every situation that gives us an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Because how are they going to accept Jesus if we haven't told them? Somebody has to tell them, right? And the Spirit is leading us to tell certain people. Right? We need to be much more I need to be much more focused on that endeavor. Because what are the consequences when they trip over the cornerstone? Smashed to pieces, right? Sent to the lake of fire. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse. How can we not have compassion you know, on people that are heading for that lake of fire and not tell them about Jesus? I know, my friend told me a long time ago that everywhere you go, preach Jesus. And if you have to, use words. But we need to use words as often as possible. Make sure people understand. Jesus is the only way. There's no other way to be saved. Have your sins forgiven. And your sinfulness separates you from God. And a separation from God is a really, really, really bad thing. So I pray everybody who hears this lesson, right? If you don't already know Jesus, you'll accept him. If you do know him, you'll make sure you're telling everybody you can. <laughs> I remember a story that just came to mind. A Christian was telling a non-Christian this story. And the non-Christian said, I don't believe that story. And he said, well, why not? And he said, because you don't even believe it. He said, what do you mean I don't believe it? If you believe that story, you'd be talking about it all the time. 
rather convicting to the Christian. I don't remember the rest of the story, that, who the missionary was, that thought he was talking about Jesus, but here's a friend who he had not talked about it, and then suddenly he did, and the, the friend's like, well, you don't believe that. If you did, I, you would have talked about it. I'd have heard about this a long time ago, right? I know, we're human. We fail, we make mistakes. God picks us up, dusts us off, and puts us back on the road again. I pray that's what he does for all of us today. Whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, well, you can decide. But for us, we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Right? Can't stop. Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord God Almighty, who rose from the dead. It is the savior of all mankind. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis in which they might punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. The people realized God had healed this man. Well, in the name of Jesus, they would think, well, that's great, but God healed this guy. This is a miracle. It was, it was an obvious miracle, right? For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. More than 40 years old, right? Like you say, everybody that was in Jerusalem knew him because they'd pass through the gate and there he'd be for all these years. More than 40 years old. I mean, pretty much the entire life of most of the people that were passing by, right? And all of a sudden... He's jumping up and down and praising God and having a great time. They're like, what the heck happened to him, right? God healed him. You know what? All of us that don't know, all people who don't know Jesus, you may have legs, but you're lame in your heart. And when God heals your heart, forgives you of all your sins, right? Spiritually, you're jumping up and down, praising God. Man, I'll bet you this guy became a Christian really quick <laughs> when he had that kind of miracle happen to him. You know, we have miracles happen to us all the time that we don't pay much attention to, right? We need to stop and give God credit. God is the provider. The Lord Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, as always, thank you for so much for your word, for your lessons, for your love, for your grace, for your forgiveness, for your Holy Spirit who convicts us all of our need for the Savior, the name that no other name can, whereby we can be saved, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the unique God-man of all history. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. And again, Lord, I want to pray for anybody who hears these words who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be their day. Your Spirit will convict them of their sin and their need for Jesus, and they will accept him to be their Savior, their Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, that is our lesson in uh, chapter 4 regarding Peter and John preaching to the Sanhedrin. <laughs> God bless y'all. Have a great week.